we have learned the basics of topology optimization. In the second part of this lecture, we talk about topology optimization for additive manufacturing. With additive manufacturing, geometric complexity is almost free, meaning that no matter how complex the geometry is, it could be fabricated with this layer upon layer additive process. For instance, a complex a bicycle frame, an artistic design, or a prosthetic leg. These geometries, they are complex, but with 3D printing, it is possible to be fabricated. This is in contrast to conventional manufacturing, like molding and machining. When we are dealing with molding and machining, we would like to make the geometry simple, otherwise it couldn't be fabricated, or the fabrication cost is very high. But with additive manufacturing, geometric complexity is not a problem. This is true for to a large extent, but there are still some constraints from the 3D printing perspective. For instance, uh, each 3D printer has a resolution limitation. You couldn't fabricate a model that is even smaller than the resolution of a 3D printer. With, uh, for instance, with fused deposition modeling, and the filament has a width of 0.4 millimeter. If you have a microstructure smaller than that, you couldn't fabricate that. And the second uh, constraint is very recognized. Uh, with 3D printing, you need support structures. If you have a geometry that has an overhang angle larger than 40 degrees or 45 degrees, you need support structures. These support structures, they are a waste of material. They also make the post-processing quite labor-intensive. Uh, a third feature of 3D printing is not really a restriction, but it's a feature of fused deposition modeling, shown on the right-hand side. Very often we use these so-called infill structures to approximate the interior to achieve a balance between uh, the amount of material and the mechanical performance. So in topology optimization for additive manufacturing, we aim to integrate these additive manufacturing constraints in topology optimization such that topology optimized shape can be directly fabricated without post-processing and make use of the features of 3D printing. One of the first examples is about infill. Uh, so in this picture, it shows the infill inside this uh, CAT model. Normally, we could select what infill we would like to use. The patterns include for instance, rectangular pattern, hexagonal pattern, or triangle pattern. You could also select how much volume you would like to have from very sparse, like 5%, to very dense, like 50%, or even a solid model, 100% of infill. This infill pattern and infill percentage play an important role for the mechanical performance. I call this infill the engineering infill. Uh, in contrast to the natural infill we could find in our human body. Uh, and this image shows the cross-section of the femur. If you look at it, the femur is composed of a uh, cortical bone on the boundary. It is very stiff and also a porous microstructures inside called trabecular bone. This porous trabecular bone, it is not really randomly distributed, but if we compare the microstructure with the stress distribution shown on the left-hand side, there's a very clear correspondence. So the microstructures, they are aligned within these principal stress directions. And these microstructures are adapted in the natural adaptation process, so it is optimized to some extent. And then comes the question, can we make use of this bone-like infill structure and how to apply the principle of bone to design infill structures for 3D printing? So we have this very powerful topology optimization tool. Uh, we prescribe a design space in 2D and we apply a load condition um, comparable to the situation where the people are standing. Uh, so the forces are vertical and we use topology optimization to design the infill structure. Let's have a look at this animation. Uh, very interestingly, this topology optimized shape is very different from the bone, the lateral bone interior structure. In a bone, 
they are microstructures that distribute within the confined space. But in topology optimization, we have either black region or empty region. This is this leads to an interesting question. So either topology optimization is so there's a contradiction between topology optimization and bone, which means one of them might be wrong. So is the bone adaptation wrong or is topology optimization wrong? Why they don't agree with each other? So uh Keep this question, we'll come back to that. So if we think about the topology optimization formulation, we have a total volume constraint. Recall the Lego block problem. We have 60 Lego blocks for the entire domain. And this total volume constraint doesn't tell anything about the local distribution. And this is one of the reasons why the material concentrates so um, we did a very simple modification to the standard topology optimization, and as a result of this modification, we obtain a detailed microstructure aligned with principal stress direction, as indicated, as visualized in this animation. There's a very good agreement between this uh, topology optimized version and this trabecular bone. This modification actually is not very complex, uh, recall the standard topology optimization. We would like to minimize the elastic energy. We have a constraint about the static equation, static equilibrium equation of elasticity, KU equals F. The design variable is allowed to change from 0 to 1 continuously, and the total amount of material should be smaller than the budgeted material. So this is a standard formulation. What we did is to replace this total volume constraint with a local volume constraint. So we don't consider the volume of the entire domain, but consider the volume in a small neighborhood, and in every small neighborhood around a point in the domain. So if we have this rectangular design domain, we discretize it into many elements, and for each of these elements, we count how many elements in the neighborhood are solid. If this local volume fraction is zero, which means in this neighborhood, none of the elements is solid. If we have a local volume fraction one, which means the entire neighborhood is solid. We don't want to have fully solid region, and that's the reason we have a upper bound on local volume fraction. In the examples I will show, we have 60% for each local area. So it tells the optimization, don't put this a neighborhood fully solid, and this constraint applies to every point in the domain. So effectively, it tells the optimization to not create fully solid structure everywhere. And if we have local volume constraint, there are many options to satisfy this local volume constraint while maximizing the stiffness. So the Optimization still has some flexibility to, to tune a material distribution while not violating this local volume constraint. So this is the essential idea of this approach. Coming to the solution process, uh, this is very similar to the standard one. We compute the displacement, we do sensitivity analysis. Uh, based on the sensitivity, we update the variable we update the density of the variable. Then we continue until it converges. And this is a test example. Uh, this top left is the design domain is 400 times 200 elements. And the one in the middle, figure B, is the optimized microstructures from this local volume constraint topology optimization. And on the right hand side is the standard topology optimization. There's a very big difference. In standard topology optimization, we have distinct empty and uh, solid regions. And in the local volume constraint topology optimization, we have microstructures satisfying the local volume constraint everywhere. Figure D 
visualizes the stress distribution, and we visualize the stress. Stress is a tensor, so it has two principal stress directions. We visualize it by this ellipse. Uh, if we look at this region, for instance, this stress is isotropic, which means along two principal stress directions, the magnitude, they are comparable. Uh, in correspondence to this uh, isotropic region, we could observe in the optimized microstructure, we have orthotropic, we have orthogonal microstructures. In some other region, for instance here, we have stresses uh, the along x direction is much larger than along y direction and corresponds to this stress distribution we have optimized structures mainly along the x direction and barely collected in the y direction. So there's a very clear relationship between a stress distribution and the optimized microstructures. And this image here visualizes the local volume constraint. So the local volume ratio we want it to be smaller than 0 0.6, so everywhere is not a, a black but a gray. And uh, these two these two plots shows the histogram. Uh, in the design, we have black and white design, so it's either material or not. So we have um, fully solid elements and fully empty elements, and we don't have elements which are not converted to uh, zero or one. This is histogram of the local volume fraction. So most of them are below 0 0.6. This is a constraint. It is satisfied. A few of them are larger than 0 0.6. This is because uh, we restrict this, uh, we satisfy this constraint in an approximate manner. So there are still some elements which don't fully satisfy this constraint. If you look into the papers, it is very well explained, uh, but I will escape, uh, escape this detail. In this lecture, we have two parameters in defining this local volume uh, fraction. Uh, one is the radius, and the second one is the volume ratio. So the first row is the radius, uh, uh, which is six elements, and the second row is 12 elements. Uh, if we look at these images, we could find out this local. Uh, radius determines the space between substructures. So if we have a larger radius, so if we measure a larger neighborhood, effectively we will have a structure that is uh, more distanced from other elements. And from left to right hand side, we have a local volume from 60% to 50% to 40%, and consequently the microstructure become, uh, the weight of the microstructure becomes smaller. So it's uh, uh, thinner and thinner. We could also place this local volume constraint and a global volume constraint at the same time. So for instance, this one is without global volume constraint. So if we say we would like to reduce some material, with, and we find out these three parts become empty, and if we compare this with this uh, stress distribution, we could find out it is the region where the stress is relatively small that is first reduced or removed. If we further reduce the amount of total volume constraint, uh, some other region will disappear as well. So we have this tool. Uh, we use it to design uh, multiple chairs. Uh, we'll see sorry, tables. So these three are tables. In 2D, we have a flat surface, and we have some fixations on the ground. And this interesting one, uh, you couldn't play, but here, uh, this point is fixed, and on the right-hand side, there's force pointing downwards, and it creates some kind of uh, spider net like structure. And on the right-hand side is a 2D frame shape, optimized, with a much higher resolution, so we could observe uh, detailed microstructures 